All right, that's five. All right, well, ah, good to caught me. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, Reimagining the future: conversation about education in a post-COVID school. Um, I'm the host. My name is uh, Chris Schamberg. I'm the coordinator of the doctoral program, and I'm a professor in it at NJCU. Um, I'm so honored to have these four wonderful educators here, all alum of our program, and all sort of doing the work of COVID and beyond uh, in their everyday lives. So I'm looking forward to hearing not only their uh, insights, but their experiences as well. Um, before we get started, um, the theme of our, our work is what are the possibilities? What are the um, lessons learned? How can we be better than we were post-COVID? But I'd like to just sort of dedicate this and take a moment of silence for um, all the people that we've lost over the last uh, close to half a million people in the United States have died because of COVID. So uh, I just always want to keep that in mind. You know, our, our optimism uh, should be, you know, sharpened for our future, but based on uh, the, the memory of those that we lost in the last uh, 11 and a half months. So please join me in just taking a moment of silence to think about someone you may have known personally or and those who uh, you didn't know who passed away. Okay, thank you, thank you so much for that. Um, all right, so let me, I'm gonna introduce our guests here. Um, again, I'm honored to have them all here. First, we have Dr. October Hudley. She's an award-winning educator and vice president of the Irvington City Council. Uh, Dr. Manuel Legrand, principal of William B. Cruz Veterans Memorial School Number 11. It's the largest elementary school in the Passaic school system. Dr. Martha Osiya, uh, principal of Alexander D. Sullivan. Especially when streaming video. We've improved me to work better if your device. All right. So uh, if everyone, oh, wait, I'm going to mute all. And then you guys unmute yourselves when you get a chance. Okay. Uh, she, oh, back to Martha. Principal of Alexander D. Sullivan School in Jersey City and author of Building a K-12 STEM Lab, Step-by-Step -step Guide for School Leaders and Tech Coaches. And Dr. Krista Wells, Library Media Specialist at North Bergen, New Jersey. And she's an internationally recognized leader and innovator in urban education and social media. So I have longer bios. I'm not doing them justice at all in this um, overview, but they are lifelong educators. They walk it like they talk it. They've got the experience and the insights. So I'm so grateful to have them as part of this uh, panel. Uh, all right, I'm gonna start off with a sort of a, oh, a little timeline here. Uh, I hope everybody could see it, but just to, what a difference a year makes. One year ago today, there were 17 reported COVID cases in the United States. Um, and people were kind of optimistic. I didn't want to distract us, but there was an interview in CNN with Anthony Fauci who said there will be minimal damage uh, in the United States uh, because of COVID. On February 29th, the first reported COVID death in the US. Uh, when we look back, there might've been one or two unreported at a time, but that's when the, the first person known death of COVID in the United States. A little more than two weeks later, all public schools in New Jersey stopped face-to-face -face instruction. Then one year later, one year after 15 cases, we have over 27 million cases in the United States and close to half a million total deaths in the United States. So, I mean, it has been some year and I don't have to tell you that, but I think your experience, sometimes when you're swimming in the ocean, it's hard to see the, you know, the two opposite shorelines, but I think sometimes you've got to take a, a, you know, a 360 degree view and, and, and appreciate the severity of what we're in the middle of. But um, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, approximately 40 million people have gotten at least one vaccination. Um, if you look at the latest map, this is today's map, the case count, both the cases and deaths are declining on a weekly basis. Uh, and the last thing I wanna mention, and this is sort of the inspiration of this um, uh, panel discussion. There's a, a book by uh, Rebecca uh, Solnit, A Paradise Built in Hell. And what she does is she studies disasters. So she studies the California earthquake, the San Francisco earthquake, um, Katrina. And she says, these events are horrible and people die in this tragedy. But in those opportunities, there are chances to look at new ways of doing things. And she sums it up this way. 
if paradise now arises in hell, it's because in the suspension of the usual order and the failure of most systems, we are free to live and act another way. So what that's what I will hope comes through in this panel. What ways, what things, what procedures, habits, um, solutions uh, are we going, did we learn a hard way and we'll keep going forward. Um, all right, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to start with um, the first question uh, to Martha. Um, Martha, uh, what were your professional challenges and solutions during the shutdown? From the start to now, uh, you can unmute yourself. I think I muted you uh, when you started, sorry about that. And thank you so much. It's a pleasure being with all of you here today and um, for learning uh, from one another. So prior to the pandemic, we were, uh, I'm a principal at a school in Jersey City and we were not a one-to-one -one school at the time. And uh, the pandemic provided us with an opportunity to have even more opportunities and access for our students. And uh, our motto was doing whatever it takes to educate our youngsters and to give them the support that they needed. And it was a multifaceted approach because what we soon learned um, at, after, we, uh, after the pandemic started was that we needed to close the digital gap. So one of the things that we did was we distributed Chromebooks to the students. And not only did we distribute Chromebooks, but we also distributed hotspots. And after giving out the Chromebooks and the hotspots, we realized that some of the families were going to need some extra tech support in knowing how to use the, the devices or um, resolving any glitches that came up. So with the support of our district, we were able to bring in uh, tech support. And we had someone come to the school um, on several occasions to meet with the families one-on-one -on -one and to troubleshoot any glitches that they may have uh, and to help provide some additional support. The district also uh, supported us with an initiative to provide tech support via the phone uh, to our parents and our family after school. So some of the families were working during the day and we were able to provide tech support and we still are providing tech support in the evenings to our families. We're also providing content area support. We have teachers on call in the evenings uh, in both Spanish, uh, for Spanish speakers English speakers and uh, to support students uh, with special needs and also providing alternate activities for those families um, that may not have a device at the time or preferred to um, have hands-on materials. So the, our staff was instrumental in ensuring that we had, uh, that we were able to distribute supplies for back to school and sub, uh, supplies textbooks, workbooks, whatever it was that they, were, that they needed. So it was a, definitely a multifaceted approach that we uh, put into place right away. Thank you, Martha. Um, Maddie, how about you? What were your professional challenges and solutions uh, during the shutdown? So I think our initial professional challenge was that we dismissed school as a regular day on Friday, March 13, 2020. And at that point, we were all planning to enter school on Monday, March 16th. Therefore, no one took their personal or professional belongings with them. We were then informed on the evening of the 16th that school would be closed for two weeks. Some teachers didn't have their laptops. Students didn't have uh, instructional materials. Teachers were not trained on how to teach remotely or the curriculum that was going to be rolled out. The district then quickly created a modified curriculum as the real realization that we were not returning anytime soon began. The district created curriculum packets and phases as the time passed, but the next challenge was getting the, the packets out to the students. Parents were afraid and, and did not want to come out to pick up the packets. Uh, many families moved, moved out without giving notice to the district, and we had no way of contacting them as a lot of parents either changed their numbers, um, couldn't afford to pay their phone bills, and all lines of communication were disconnected. Once the packets were printed out, the district spent thousands of dollars on, on, on postage to get these packets delivered. And many students did not get their packets to, due to the change of address or due to the fact that these packets were pretty thick packets. And being a densely populated uh, city, we have a lot of students that live in, in, in buildings that may have 40, 50 students living in, in one building. And the postal workers, um, they were reluctant to carry the packets due to the weight. 
So the packet sat in the post office for weeks until we eventually um, got to speak with the postmaster and tried to get them rolled out um, in an expedited time. Um, in the beginning, we did not have enough Chromebooks for, for every student. So we were giving one, one Chromebook per family. But the fact is that our families have multiple children. So eventually we made some contacts and we purchased more Chromebooks and now every student has one. Um, we also began this school year with a mostly online curriculum and have moved away from packets, but we are still delivering um, some instructional materials to support the online uh, curriculum that's in place. Currently, I think our biggest struggle is getting students to one, log on on time, and two, to log in for the entire day. A lot of time, some parents or babysitters, they have the students helping them with the younger sibling or, or they have to go to the doctor. Um, so the, the length of time that they're on is inconsistent and the amount of students that the teachers have one-on-one -on -one with every student in their classes, it's a little inconsistent. Um, we have come a long way since March of 2020 and, and we continue to work diligently um, supporting our teachers and they're doing um, an excellent job, um, especially with the amount of screen time that we do. So again, and we're in the process of refining um, our re remote learning. As of right now, we're remote learning until April 25th. Wow, thank you. October, you have a little bit of a different perspective uh, as a, a vice chair of the city council. Would you kind of share your experiences during COVID? Yes, first of all, I would like to say thank you so much, Dr. Schomburg, for inviting me to the forum. As a council member, one of my duties is to provide information and services to the residents of the community. Prior to COVID, we would simply come in, come in contact physically with the residents, either by going door to door, hosting and attending events. However, once the pandemic hit, all hands were on deck. The mayor, my council colleagues, the directors, public safety, health directors, um, INIC, which is the Irvington Neighborhood Improvement Court, and also um, Department of Public Works. We met together to design a plan on how we could continue to distribute information to the residents in ways where we could reduce the spread and also to make sure that we were also safe. Some of the ways we were able to accomplish the task was by increasing the number of mailers, providing daily updates on our local township website, robocalls, and also using social media, for example, Facebook Live. It was crucial to inform the residents and provide them with information pertaining to COVID-19. For example, we had residents that needed to know location of testing sites. Um, we had food and clothing distributions throughout the township where we provided information and resources for those in need. And we also provided information for rental assistance because a lot of people became unemployed at that time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, October. Um, Dr. Wells, I'll ask the same question. How, what were your professional challenges and solutions during the shutdown? Well, you know, honestly, for, for those of us who have been virtual since September, we've never met our students in person. And I think a lot of people on here uh, have that experience. You know, we've, we've interacted with them on Zoom uh, and Google Meet, but I know one of the challenges, most of the students keep their, their cameras off. So we don't even know what half of them even look like. If we tripped over them in the hallway, we wouldn't even know that those were our students. But I could really see these teachers are working very hard every day to make some type of connection with their students. And I really think one of the main challenges for teachers um, has, has really been to constantly shift their focus. And I think you guys agree with me. Um, we are trying to keep up with, I know all the virtual teacher meetings, um, I know that's like tripled and motivating the students, but because of all of these meetings and teaching, the teacher workload has tripled. Um, I know some teachers, they say that they've never worked so hard in their life. Um, and you would think you're, you're at home, most of you are at home at remote, that it would be a little easier going, but it's not. 
Um, I know that most of us are answering emails late at night, whether it's from administrators or from students. Um, but I think even the switch to virtual meetings happened very easily, in my opinion, because I am so surprised at how well schools can function while working remotely and um, how these major changes can be established in really short spans of time. Um, this has kind of left me hopeful that maybe more flexible lifestyles will be encouraged in the future to accommodate us, um, especially as teachers. Um, what I really want students and teachers to take away, um, what knowledge that I want them to take away is that, you know, life really can subtly change completely. But even though this is difficult and scary, we are, as teachers, very adaptable and we are stronger than we think. That's great. Krista, um, I remember about two years ago, a lecture you gave to the um, doctoral students and it was it touched on the idea of self-care and that's my next question and I, I, I like the foreground this on kind of news people could use it and an awareness that this is important so i'm going to ask all of them but let me start with you uh how do you cope with the emotional strain on yourself your colleagues uh your students do you have any tips for people to uh, take care of themselves um that's a good question i'm going to be completely honest and um the best thing that you could do, whether you're a student or a teacher, if you're stressed, go to sleep. <laughs> sleep is amazing. Okay, go to either go to bed earlier, take naps during the day if you can. Um, I have found that there are times when I can't even think. I mean, like my brain is just it won't even work. Um, but you know, I, I take a nap it could be. 20 minutes and it, it, I don't know how your brain does it, but you just feel so refreshed and you're back up, you're ready to work again, clean the house, whatever. Um, some of my students, they actually told me that they, they've they learned to meditate and I, I can't believe students, they've never told me this, but now students are really um, self-learning how to meditate by just listening to peaceful music and focusing on your breathing, that really, really helps. Um, a few things that I like to do to relax is play soothing jazz instrumentals in the background when I'm working. Go on YouTube and just type in jazz instrumental. Um, they have beautiful sceneries, snow, oceans, and it's usually the piano and the soothing trumpet. They always make me relax because uh -huh. they somehow set like this melancholy tone and overall ambience. And there's this really cool website. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. Even the teenagers, if you teach high school, the teenagers love it. It's called Drive and Listen. You actually listen to local radio stations while you're like virtually watching someone drive throughout cities around the world. And it, it's, pre it's pretty relaxing because you know, I love to drive, but you could pick different cities and you're immediately placed in that driver's seat. And the driving is very slow. You know, we're not race, they're not racing. And you just see the world go by and they have very, uh, relaxing music and it's especially nice when you're driving at night in the rain um, i'm actually going to put the link in the chat box if you guys want to actually that, that reminds me thank you so much actually i'm going to check that out uh, later <laughs> um i'd like to ask that to october but i see the the chat's blowing up with this one if everyone could just post um you know any idea they have please put it in the chat and uh, we'll collect these and maybe i'll distribute them uh, later on so any self-care habits or routines or, or things you have. Uh, Dr. Hudley, um, would you care to share, how do you take care of yourself? I mean, you have a very stressful job um, in the city council. Dr. Hudley, can you, are you there? Oh, I'm sorry, I had my mic on. Oh, when the pandemic hit, we had to initiate a lockdown where everyone had to stay home. And to um, the residents felt some sort of disconnect with us and with the mayor. And so we decided to use Facebook Live as a forum to connect with the residents, just to reassure them, you know what, everything is gonna be okay. We are okay, because they actually were worried about us, just as we were worried about them. And I know how important it is to keep your health, your body, your mind, everything in tune to keep your immune system up. So I created this Hutley's Healthy Workout 
um, challenge where Monday through Friday, I would literally go and go on to Facebook Live and I just transformed into some sort of, I guess you could say exercise guru. So I would turn my pump up music on and I'm like, come on, let's go get off the couch. Come on, you could do, come on, let's do this together. And mentally that helped me. And that also helped um, the people out there. And I guess you could say my Facebook family um, create some sort of calmness, you know, motivate them. I just want to inspire them. You know, we're going to get through this pandemic. I also created a Hutley's Healthy, um, <laughs> what was it? Hutley's Healthy um, Home Creation, where I created food dishes. And I posted um, dishes that were healthy on Facebook Live and also on Instagram. And I also posted um, many videos on how you could create these dishes to help them physically, you know, keep their body and their immune system strong. Great, and thank you. Yeah. I'm a fan Dr. of your Facebook Sharma. post. Dr. Sharma, did you see me work out a couple of times? I, hope yeah, I did, I, lo I loved it, it inspired me. So uh, thank you. Uh, Maddie, how about you? What, what do you, do for to take care of yourself. So, so I had to learn quick because I saw I, I saw myself working um, from the morning all the way till eight nine o'clock at night, still on the computer at all times, um, answering emails, preparing for the next day, and so forth. So I, I, I cope with emotional strain by taking time out of my day to sit back, meditate, and practice breathing techniques. I'm, I'm learning and I'm I'm doing a better job to shut my computer off at the end of the work day, and make time for myself to make sure. I do what makes me feel good, whether it's watching a movie, listening to music, uh, reading, or taking a long walk with my dog. Having a balance between work and self, like you said, self-help, self-care, is very important for us to be effective at our jobs and as humans. Um, I think we all need to do a better job at balancing the stress of work and everyday life with what brings joy to our lives. At the school, we've also implemented a social emotional learning program that supports students and staff stress uh, with stress, emotion, and coping strategies and techniques to overcome challenges and obstacles in their work, academic, and family life. The program also su has supports and intervention for our families to make sure that they're included in what we're promoting. Uh, we've also implemented a system to acknowledge and highlight the great and outstanding things that students and our, our teachers are doing during the remote learning process. There's many great things that are going on out there and many people that are going above and beyond. And I think that acknowledgement and praise goes a long way during these tough times. Great, thank you. Martha, how about you? What do you, what do, you do to uh, to recharge yourself? So, um, well, first of all, I wanna say that I love how everyone's sharing their ideas and how we're crowdsourcing. <laughs> so thank you so much. So please continue sharing. Um, I think it's important to set boundaries and I have to be quite honest with you. I'm, I may agree with Dr. Negron. Um, the boundaries are our key, but this is something that, that I'm still working on and, uh, and drawing some boundaries because it's very easy to get up in the morning as soon as you get up and start answering emails and text messages and it's eight, nine, 10 o'clock at night and you're doing the same, trying to keep up. So, um, so definitely uh, setting boundaries is key and um, establishing a support system. I have great colleagues that I can go to if I need feedback, if I, you know, just support ideas, we're certainly not alone as educators. We're not alone in this and uh, really establishing a cohort of uh, colleagues and friends that can support you in this endeavor. And uh, taking a look at elements that incorporate joy and bring joy to your life. And I was doing some self-reflection and I realized a lot of the things that brought me joy included travel, included spending time with my family, uh, going to special events. And those are things that I'm not able to do right now. So, um, so it gave me an opportunity to reframe my thinking of how I could do some of the things that I loved and I enjoyed virtually. So for instance, just spending, doing a virtual uh, family game night. So how can I turn some of the activities that I like to do in a virtual, uh, turn it into a virtual environment? So virtual book clubs, uh, virtual meetups. I recently did a, a paint night so my daughter works for Disney and one of the animators from, from Disney actually did a hosted a paint night. So I joined her and her team. So, so that was fabulous. So thinking outside of the box and still doing some of the things that we loved to do uh, previously, but with a, a virtual twist is what I would say. That's great. That's great. 
Um, you, you know, the answers are so good. I'm a little behind schedule, so I'm going to jump to a question that's at the heart of this um, uh, panel discussion. You know, we did some research in ed tech. Um, we surveyed over a thousand teachers in New Jersey, and people reported two types of success. Yes, it's stressful. Yes, this is not the preferred way to teach. But there are two types of success. One was conditional success, like we're almost at normal or I'm getting into a routine. The other we called absolute success. And this is where people reported that they were doing things. It was, a, it was only about 15% of the responses, but it was there. That they were doing things that were better than pre-pandemic. Uh, so do, do, are there any examples you could think of of uh, a practice, a procedure, um, an occurrence that you had to do for the pandemic or happened during the pandemic, but you think you would like to keep or follow through with after, um, after this is over. Uh, let me ask, uh, I'll go to Manny first. So yeah, Dr. Schenberg, um, I can relate to absolute success. Mm -hmm. as, as I took over the school five years ago and pretty much was put in place to turn around the school due to the many challenges that the school was facing. And in five years, I had established many policies, procedures, and protocols in place uh, during in-person instruction that resulted in success in academics, along with the overall climate and culture of the school. So moving to remote learning due to the shutdown made me realize that I didn't want to reinvent the wheel, but rather transform and refine what I had established in person and now move it towards a digital approach. Um, my administrative team and I, we re redeveloped all of our documents, policies, and procedures into one single file called the School 11 Reference Sheet. And pretty much was, everything was modified uh, towards a more, I guess, digital platform and, and uh, aligned with um, digital expectations. So from our lesson plan templates, they were uh, redesigned to, to fit remote learning and teaching. Our uh, lesson plan checklist um, our attendance procedures. Everything was changed and modified into different um, online platforms, but under one single file. So it was like the overall viable for our teachers and staff members to go to for any link of any reference, any document, any template that they may need. It was all in one spot. Um, again, this included uh, all the revised information and everything was designed for that teachers can be successful throughout the remote teaching and learning process through a technological approach. Um, little by little, we had some hiccups with people that who were not used to um, dealing with, you know, certain platforms or, or let's just say using Google Voice and setting up the Google Voice accounts and so forth. But um, we have a lot of other people that are experts in those areas. So everyone has pitched in and helped each other out. And right now we're working almost flawlessly. Um, and it looks just, just about the same way as we were in person um, with no major issues in hand. Great, thank you. Um, Martha, could, could you add anything to that? Like what, are there any habits that you've picked up during a pandemic that you will keep after the vaccine is a widespread? I would definitely say con continuing to provide the parents with the additional technology support, helping uh, not only with content area support during evening hours, but also helping the parents with tech support with our, we have Google gurus uh, and parents, we give them a, a phone number, they can email the teachers, and they can uh, reach out for any tech questions and tech support. So I would definitely um, continue to provide that additional support for the working parents in the evenings. Thank you. Uh, Krista, how about you? Any, anything you're going to keep doing that you've picked up during the pandemic? Well, you know what, I think I'm a big believer in the absolute success. Um, like I said before, I think most of us have adapted to virtual learning and working remotely, and it's really the, the new norm for us. But however, for our students, they are struggling with this new norm. Um, just to tell you a personal thing, one of my STEM students just recently gave the high school students a survey to fill out regarding virtual versus traditional in-class learning and what they preferred. And 63% of the students in high school said they, they favored in-class learning. They stated, you know, how they missed their friends, you know, walking down the hallway, high-fiving their friend, um, the pep rallies, the teacher telling you to stop talking to your friends during class. But now what? We can't even get most of our students to talk to us during virtual learning. So it's, it's, it's a completely different way of living and learning. And 
I know that one of the biggest problem is we've always taught our students that group work is the way to go. Um, we would just give them their assignment and say, okay, now split up in, into your groups. So they were so used to working in teams. And then when virtual learning started, all the students were alone, right? They, they have to work on their own. And I don't know about you guys, but I know the kids in my school, they hate virtual breakout rooms. It's very awkward. Um, and a lot of work just doesn't get done in these breakout rooms. So that's why I feel in the future, we really do have to teach kids in elementary, middle school, high school about self-directed learning. You know, teach them how to organize, pace their work, break the work into daily and weekly tasks and focus really less on assi assessments and grades. Um, and for those of you guys, you know, who, who look at Pinterest, Twitter, all the social media, this is why you've seen that choice boards have become such a, a huge hit in the virtual classroom. Um, I really think that they have to find self-directed activities in order to take the responsibility for their own learning. And we really have to start designing self-directed learning experiences for the students that build upon their prior knowledge, interest, and curiosity. And I'm gonna put in the, the chat box, um, a great way of looking at this is the 5E model, which is engage, explore, explain, elaborate, and I forgot the other one, but it was developed by Roger Bivey. And it, it really is used in STEM and STEAM, and it really encourages student engagement and inquiry. So let me put that link in for you guys. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Dr. Hudley, um, how about you? What, um, what do you think you will continue, especially as your role as a um, vice president of the Irvington City Council? What do you think processes will continue uh, after the vaccinations become widespread? Well, as much as we would like to revert back to the old way of doing things, I highly find that possible. And trying new technologies is a good thing. Um, currently, we use Zoom meeting to host all our meetings. And it's very um, accommodating, convenient. We can do it from home where we're safe. And that's something, a platform that I would like to continue seeing that we use within the township. And also there's other technologies that we use where we're able to reach masses of residents to provide them with information. And also they could get a rapid response using the technologies. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, the next question is, uh, and again, I, I, I love the, um, who used the term? Uh, Mar Martha, um, crowd, crowdsource, crowdsourcing it. Um, what surprised you the most about the pandemic? Um, or um, how have, you could go two ways on this one. What surprised you the most about the pandemic or how have you seen change over the course of the pandemic? So the idea is change or surprise. Um, and I'll go to um, Martha first with that one. Well, first off, I wanna say that parents are doing an exceptional job of, of supporting our teachers, supporting our students. Uh, despite the pandemic, what most surprised me um, at this time is the connection between the home and the school environment. And we're finding that in our lower grades, the pre-K to two grades, a lot of the parents are joining in the lessons. We have virtual field trips for the children to Liberty Science Center and, and to different places and the parents are joining in. When we have hands-on opportunities, the parents are helping out their little ones, supporting the teachers. So it's great to see our teachers and our parents uh, working more than ever hand in hand. So this is something that, uh, that's been great. And we hope that it continues because the little ones are at home, they need the extra support. And we are very appreciative that the parents are, are there working side by side with us. Thank you very much. Uh, Manny, how about you? What has either surprised you the most or has changed the most over time? Manny, you might be muted. Let me see. Manny, you might be muted. Yes. 
Yeah, you were muted. I just, Manny, you were muted. I'm sorry. No problem. Thank you. I think what surprised me the most is how surreal it got in a short period of time. I think many people did not realize how serious the pandemic was until the numbers were being reported and the number of deaths began to rise. Things really started making people afraid when it started getting close to home and you, be you begin to hear friends and loved ones testing positive for COVID-19 and or dying on a daily basis. As a principal, I had to be there for students who lost their parents, um, some their parents and grandparents or multiple members in a single household because they all lived together in one apartment. I also had to support my staff through the struggles and pain as they too lost family members and they were worried about their own families and yet they continued to do their best to be the most effective teachers supporting our students. And so again, it's been a struggle, but I think, um, you know, things came to light really quick. Thank you. October, um, did I, I, I skipped over you, sorry, October. How about you? What surprised you the most or uh, have you seen change the most? Um, what surprised me the most was how the stores took advantage of people during the crisis with the price gouging. Um, and I was also surprised of how people in the community came together to support one another, uh, whether it was volunteering for food distribution or whether it was just calling their neighbors to see if there was anything that they need. I mean, it was just phenomenal just to see how everyone came together as one big family. That's great, thank you. Uh, and Krista, I'm gonna springboard that question and I'm gonna to pivot to the next one too. Um, on a practical level, what, um, what tools or techniques do you get the most leverage from? And also, if you wanna finish up, what surprised you the most about the pandemic? Well, you know what? I, I'm actually gonna share, I, I actually gave you guys a huge um, Google Doc of the tools that, that we've been using in our school and just all types of tips. Um, but for the other question, I just wanted to, if you guys don't have a technology professional development committee in your school, you really should have it because what we did is we offered uh, voluntary PD in the summer just to prepare the teachers um, for this virtual learning. Um, most of them were just worried about the littlest things like splitting their screen so they could see the students on one side while they presented. Um, but like I said before, the teachers really adapted and just by getting this type of uh, professional development almost every week, every month, um, whether you, you work with a tech coach, which a lot of schools have, or you work with media specialists like me, um, they just, it was much better for them that they, they were really at ease. So I'm gonna actually drop this link in um, the chat box and it's a huge document on what we've been using in the school. And I'll just go over a couple of them. All right, if you guys wanna click on that link, there's like a lot of tricks on there on how you could hide the YouTube ads when you give it to kids and distractions. There's the Chrome extension that enables you to go into full screen when you're in Google Slides, when you're editing. So this way the, the screen isn't so small. I threw a lot of templates that are free on there. Um, Clipboard History Pro Chrome extension is great when you're writing the same thing over to the same students. So I'm giving you guys a lot of goodies on there. Please look at it, make use of it, and please email me if you want any more. Wow, thank you so much. This is a really uh, chock full of great ideas. You're welcome. Wonderful. So uh, I'll ask um, October next. Uh, October, on a practical level, uh, you alluded to Facebook, and I have to say Facebook Live, you do use that very effectively in your job, but um, would you like to talk about that or any other tool that you feel you got a lot of leverage at, out of? Um, on a, well, I would say Facebook Live is a great platform to use to reach out to people, especially um, since we're living in times where they encourage us to stay home to help curb this um, virus. And um, I've reached quite a few people through Messenger, more so than using the email. People are actually using their phones now. And it's, I think it's just so much more convenient when you use Facebook as a tool to communicate with people. Um, they don't even pick up the phone and call anymore. That's kind of like the thing of the past. Everything is about texting. So 
I encourage, you know, I, I enjoy using uh, Facebook. And people know that they can reach me at any time. Unfortunately, I'm not one of those that get to sleep much. <laughs> I don't get the rest. I mean, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, I'm available. And that's because I love keeping in contact with my residents. Thank you. Thank you, October. And uh, your name in Irvington is, you know, is, is golden. So uh, I definitely attest to that. Uh, Manny, um, what tools, techniques, uh, would, or uh, technologies would you recommend uh, to people uh, that you got the most leverage from during the pandemic? I think I looked at it more as a strategy. Okay, that's great. Yeah, that's a, that, I consider that a tool. So okay. the strategy that provided me the most leverage professionally was identifying the strengths and resources that each staff member had to contribute towards the overall success of remote teaching and learning. I had to quickly realize that with a school of my size, I would not be successful if I thought I was going to suddenly transform to a remote learning environment by myself. So my administrative team and I quickly conducted a step-by-step -step needs assessment by prioritization to identify what our first steps were following uh, by the remaining. Once we identified what needed to get done, we assigned specific tasks and responsibilities to key staff members and then divided those responsibilities by grade level, K to two, three to five, six to eight. When our initial plan and, um, was agreed upon we, and we were ready to roll it out, we provided our teachers um, with a detailed presentation of all aspects of our transformation, along with the assigned port of contacts to reach out to for any specific assistance by grade level and or content area. I can honestly say that we have a smooth and transparent system in place that leaves little room for error and is, and is established to support all students, staff, and families. But from time to time, we do assess and discuss our system to allow for modifications when and if needed. Thank you. Martha, how about you? What, um, any tool, technique um, that you would recommend that you got a lot of leverage out of? Sure, so I would say definitely as a school leader, uh, the two most practical tools and uh, would be communication and digitizing everything that we do. And clear communication is key. And I would say even over communicating because we need to get a clear message from central office as to what we should be doing protocols, procedures uh, in terms of the reopening of the schools. And also as a building uh, level principal, it's important to communicate with our parents, with our teachers. Um, gone are the days that you can walk into a classroom and speak to a teacher directly or at dismissal speak to the parent in the courtyard. So now you need to find um, every opportunity to be able to, to communicate information to the teachers. For example, if a child uh, has a broken device and they come to the school uh, with a concern, it's important for me to let that teacher know that Johnny's mom came in and Johnny needs a replacement and we're working on that so that she, he or she knows um, that Johnny's going to need some alternative assignment and is going to need some extra support at home. Um, so it's, or vice versa, if um, Mary gets a new device, we need to let the teacher know, Mary can log on this afternoon. We were able to give her a device. We were able to give her a hotspot. So it's extremely important that we communicate uh, with our teachers, with our parents. And I would also say digitizing everything that we do. Google Suites has been uh, extremely helpful as a learning management tool. And from an administrative uh, point of view, we use Google Sheets a lot. So that's been instrumental with our Chromebook distribution, with our hotspot distribution, with a list of replacement devices uh, that we need. It helps us manage everything. And we have the information from home, from school, teachers have it. So we do a lot of sharing and also Google Forms has been great uh, with uh, getting information from the parents, parent surveys, emergency contact forms. All of those are, are simple but crucial elements that we need and we have to have our finger on that information at all times. So it's uh, real time data, which is great. Thank you, sorry, it was such good advice. I knocked over my printer, uh, I appreciate it. Um, so one last question uh, and actually I had two but you can combine them and then we'll take some questions from the audience. And I wanted to have Dr. Zeger wrap this up. Um, how, say the, let's assume the mass vaccinations are, are going to 
be a real help as planned. How do you see school or education changing after mass vaccinations? Uh, and what are the lessons learned from the shutdown? And do you have any concluding advice? So um, let me take, I'm gonna go out of order a little bit because I skipped a few questions. Uh, well, actually, let me just go with the order I put for this one. Um, well, yeah, we've got October, uh, you, can have the, you can have the first last word on that one. Yes, I would just like to say, um, on a personal note, I did take the first shot of the vaccination. Um, I was apprehensive, but I just feel that, you know, we need to bring society back to some sort of normalcy. And by any means necessary, if that means taking a vaccine, I'm all for it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Martha, how about you? Um, what do you see as the, um, let me fix my slides here, um, future for schools? And do you have any concluding remarks or, or, or thoughts? I think the future is definitely hopeful uh, in terms of the max, mass va vaccinations. Um, hopefully that'll bring the, the peace of mind that our teachers need uh, since they're working with children and that they are essential workers. And it's going to add uh, an additional layer of protection. Uh, although we have yet to see how many people are able to get vaccinated. Um, so the ability to, to get vaccinated is, is the key, but I think it's certainly going to bring um, that layer of peace of mind that, that our teachers need and our parents need. Uh, Krista, how about you? What do you see as the future uh, for schools and how um, do you have any concluding thoughts or remarks? You know, I think my on, my opinion is a little bit different than most. Um, I feel that the COVID vaccination is not going to be 100% effective. You know, we all know that. Um, we also don't know the long, long term side effects of this vaccine. You know, I know we're all thinking about that. But even if a teacher gets the vaccine, I feel like some of them think they're going to have this invisible shield against this virus. And that's not going to happen. Coronavirus is not going away. There's going to be different strains. And I know from personal experience, and I, and I told Dr. Schamberg and Martha this before I came on, I know a few, few teachers who have gotten the virus from students bringing it into the classroom. The students' parents had the virus and sent their children to school. Now, these teachers didn't have the vaccine yet, but even if they did have the vaccine, they could potentially get you know, sick. Whether it be a fever from the antibodies working, um, they could still get muscle aches, nasal congestion. My point is, even though we do have vaccines, teachers and students, they're still gonna get sick. It's not gonna be 100% uh, effective. And I was looking last night and one of the CDC guidelines states, and I'm gonna read it here, school systems should recruit and train sufficient substitute educators to ensure that teachers can stay home when they're sick or have been exposed to someone who is confirmed or suspected of having COVID-19. Now are schools gonna have more access to substitute teachers? That this is a problem that school administrators really have to think about before fully opening for in-class instruction. Great points. That's really good stuff. Yeah. Uh, Maddie, how about you? What do you see as the future of education uh, after mass vaccinations? And do you have any concluding remarks? So I, I think that unless the vaccines are mandated for all students and staff, um, I see brick and mortar traditional learning fading away and more towards a hybrid or a la carte model. Um, even now, even before COVID, um, you, you, you wouldn't realize the amount of letters that I get from parents um, asking for excusal uh, from mandated vaccines currently due to religious beliefs and so forth. And, and they're excused. We cannot exclude them from school due to them not taking those vaccines. So with the COVID vaccine, um, then denying it, and, and obviously a lot of people ha don't have faith in it and have lost trust in it. I can see that a lot of uh, parents do not want their children to receive the vaccine. I can see a lot of staff members not wanting the vaccine. So I think that slowly but surely, but it was coming a long time already. Um, we're fading away to more hybrid uh, uh, a la carte type of learning. And those that want to remain remote will remain. And those that will, I guess, um, excel towards a more traditional one-on-one -on -one, face to face with, with um, teachers um, those, those supports will be provided. 
But again, it's a whole logistical process that would need to revamp the whole educational system. Thank you so much. And what, I, what I'd like to do is this chat, you guys have really um, exploited, the, capitalized on the chat really well. Do you have any concluding thoughts or ideas about this? And while you're putting your ideas in chat, I want to turn over the, um, let me just, the microphone to uh, Dr. Zeger, uh, who has, is going to give us some concluding remarks. First, thank you so much to the panelists and thank you for the participants. This was really a, a great interactive event. Your ideas um, were wonderful. Um, we're all in this together and we're all going to come out together. And uh, success is only success when it's success for everyone. So thank you so much for being a part of this. Um, Dr. Zeger, please, um, you have the, let me just make sure, let me text me if you need to be made a co-host, but I'm going to make you one right now. Thank you, Dr. Schamberg. Everyone can hear me? Yes. Great. First and foremost, I want to thank Dr. Schamberg for putting together this amazing panel and this uh, really, really insightful um, hour for all of us. I really believe that this was very, very helpful, not only in that we got to talk about some of the issues that are so important to us, but we got to see the, the perspectives of a lot of different people, not only our panel, which was so insightful, but also the, the chat, people talking about the ways that they're, they're getting through some of the things that they're doing and, and some of the great ideas and suggestions, and then also some of the trials and tribulations, because you know these same challenges are happening for everyone. And if we can, you know, you, you call it crowdsourcing, but again, it's, it's actually becoming our community, right? It's leaning on each other as a community. As I'm watching our panel talk tonight, I'm saying to myself, the one thing that these four people have in common other than being educators is that they've all been, they're, they're doctors from our program. And I'm absolutely, I'm gonna brag because I'm proud. <laughs> uh, I'm absolutely so proud of the fact that, you know, they're not afraid to talk about the hard issues. They come up with insightful and great ideas. They're out there on social media. You know, they're doing things, they're bringing in people, they're, they're developing communities. They're not just doing the, the, the mechanics mechanics of education, you can tell they care. And so, and everyone here tonight, I know, you know, we all kind of have that same feeling. We really care. That's why we're in this. And um, Dr. Schamberg, again, thank you for doing this. I hope that perhaps we can do this again, bring in some more opinions and ideas from our community. And um, if anyone is interested, you know I have to say this, in our doctoral program or our master's programs in ed tech or school library media specialists, our brand new STEM certificate program, definitely email me or any of us and we'll be more than happy to talk about it. I think, you know, I keep getting emails from our alumni saying thank you so much that we've really given them the tools they needed to be successful. And so I'd love to be able to do that for more. So thank you, Dr. Schamberg and all of you for coming tonight, our panel, our amazing panel. Wonderful again, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, panel. I really appreciate this and thank you participants. Um, please have a great rest of the week and I hope we all get our vaccines soon. And oh, one last question I want to ask. All right, with all, I completely agree with what Dr. Wells said and Dr. Negron said that things are never gonna be perfectly back to normal again, and we are gonna have things better and different and changed. But one question, what is the one thing you're looking forward to doing that you haven't really been able to do in the last 11 months? Just put it in the chat, just throw it in the chat. Uh, go to a concert, oh, go out with friends, yeah, yeah, good, good. Vacation, hugs, law, well, yeah, travel. Go to Vegas, that's nice. Yeah. Broadway, <laughs> beach bars. Oh, I'm sorry, I asked this one. You're thinking of things I didn't think of. <laughs> Theater, yes. NYC. Dr. Schemberg, may I say something? Oh, but throw it in the Yes, you have it. Go ahead, please. You're talking to me? You asked to say something. Go ahead. Oh, okay. It was extremely, extremely interesting and enlightening and if i may on the basis of what everybody has said you ask what would we like to see and the answer to me is clear i would like to see 
technology becoming like electricity, like like every like uh, communication. It is. It should become part of part of the equality that we want for all children in the U.S. It should become. It should become everywhere for everyone and you have the right you have the right people who can who can address it you have the right school who can address it and you have the right leaders and it's really it, it's it's a transformative thing this covid maybe is the beginning of making technology available everywhere in the us everybody should have Wi-Fi, and every child they have books for free. They should have computer for free. And you are the best people to adopt this idea and let it fly. Thank you, Hannah. I'm gonna I'm gonna share my uh, share my stipend my my moderator stipend with you, <laughs> which was nothing. But thank you very much in spirit. Dr. Schamberg, it. It, can I say it's, uh, one last thing? Please do. Yes. Okay, guys. Um, I just wanted to to tell you honestly. Um. My, my co-workers on here with me too. And yesterday we asked them a very honest question. They're all virtual and we asked them, what makes our class, we're, we're online, different from your other high school classes? And the one student quietly said, you actually talk to us. You actually talk to us, that's what they said. He said, most of his other teachers just assign them work and say, okay, here's your assignment. Please use this time to work on it. That's it. So like, I really want you guys, please talk to your students, ask them how they're doing, ask them how their families are doing, ask them how their other classes are doing. And keep in mind that there are so many ways to say, I care about you. And the best gift to give to your students is your honest self. Thank you, Thank you so much. That's such a great uh, way to end on. And we're exactly 4.59. Enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your year. Um, stay strong. There's a light at the end of the tunnel and better days ahead. I'm going to end the meeting, but thank you so much for being a part of this today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.